Today we're going to talk about how to share memory between two different programs. Hey, what's up friends? A while back I did a video about how to share memory between two processes using MMAP. That was a really simple example, but it had one major shortcoming and that's that it only really works well when you are cloning the processes from an original parent process. So you start with one process and they clone and so you have a parent and child and then they can share memory. So if that's your situation, that's really easy. Just use MMAP. But if the parent child calls exec, basically replaces the child or let's say that you have two programs that are started independently that you want to share memory, then this MMAP approach doesn't really work well. So today I want to show you how to set up shared memory between two programs that aren't just clones of each other. As always, all source code for this video is available through Patreon. For those of you that are new to the channel, that's a great way to support this channel. And a huge thanks to all of you who support this channel in different ways. Also, I just want to point out that this video assumes you have a basic understanding of how computer memory works and how programming that memory addresses, pointers, things like that work. I'm also assuming a basic understanding of processes and fork. I put a bunch of links in the description to other videos that I've made that can help out if you're not quite to that point yet. This example is going to work for Linux and Mac OS, probably just about any Unix based operating system. Sorry to all you Windows users, mileage may vary, but now let's get into shared memory. So in my prior example, I used MMAP. The program set up a block of shared memory, set it to be shared, and then called fork. Fork clones the address space, so that makes two identical copies of the address space, but it leaves that shared block as it is because I marked it as shared, so now I have shared memory between these two clones. So in this case, this is really simple. It's easy to find the shared memory because we presumably started out with a pointer somewhere in both processes that's keeping track of where that memory block is in our address space. It's basically just the address that was returned from MMAP. And that's the challenge that we're going to deal with when we have two different processes. One is going to create the block of shared memory and the other is going to need to attach it, basically map it into its address space. And for this to work, we need some way to specify, really to find the memory block we want. And any of you that have spent some time with Unix-based software won't be surprised to find that we use the file system. Pretty much everything in Unix or Linux seems to look like a file, so this really doesn't seem that odd. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to designate a file and associate our block of shared memory with that file. Now, I don't want to confuse anything. This has nothing to do with the contents of the file. We're just associating a block of shared memory with a particular file, and we're going to use that file, that file name, to actually find the block of shared memory. This is not to be confused with actually mapping the contents of that file into memory. I do have another video about how to do that using MMAP, but that's not what we're talking about today. In this case, all we're doing is associating the file with the shared memory block so that when a program wants to share that memory, they can just request it. So it works like this. Say we have a file called a.c. It doesn't have to be a C source file. It can be any file, name it whatever you like, as long as it's a real file that really exists on disk. Then program A can say, I want to create a block of shared memory and associate it with file a.c. Then program B, which was started sometime later or whenever really, it doesn't really matter, can come along and say, hey, I would like to access the block of shared memory that's associated with A.C and voila, we have shared memory. So conceptually, that's all we're doing here. Now we're going to use a few different functions, FTOK, SHM get, SHM mat, SHM DT, SHM CTL. Clearly the creator wasn't really paying attention to how these functions are going to be pronounced. I mean, who knows what they were thinking. FTOK or FTOK just gets a numeric key associated with the file name that we're playing with. SHM get uses that key to create or get a block of shared memory associated with that key and it's going to return a shared memory block ID. Then Schmat uses that block ID to map the block into this process's address space and give us a pointer to that block so we can actually start using the memory. And from that point on, it's just memory. It just looks like any other block of memory. Now, I know this probably seems like a lot of steps just to get a block of shared memory set up. And there are a couple of reasons for it. One is that this numeric key associated with a file thing is used with more things than just blocks of shared memory. It's used in at least one other thing and that's semaphores, which we're really not gonna talk about today, but that would be a great topic for a future video. But now without further ado, let's jump into the code. So for this example, I've written three short programs. One writes to a block of shared memory, one reads from it, and the third up here deletes the block. Real applications will probably be more complicated. They may read and write. They may read, write, then delete. 
create whatever, do with it what you want. But for our example, this will suffice. Now, when I started putting this together, I noticed there's a lot of duplicate code. So I made two additional files, this sharedmemory.h and sharedmemory.c. These files just have common code in them, code that each of these different programs are going to use. It's kind of like our own little shared memory library. So let's start out with these two files. Now, our little library here is going to have three operations. We can attach to a shared memory block. We can detach from a shared memory block or detach the shared memory block from our process. And we can destroy a block. And these two defines down here are just for convenience. Block size specifies what size of shared memory block we're going to create. And file name tells us what file we're going to associate the block with. In a fully generic library, this would probably be defined elsewhere. But for here, I just put it here for convenience. So these are the three functions that we're going to support in our library. Let's now look at how they're implemented. Um, first, these shared memory functions pretty much all return negative one if they fail, if there's some kind of error. So I just defined my error result to be negative one up here. So I wouldn't have a bunch of magic numbers in my code. Next, there's this static function here. Static just makes it visible just inside this translation unit. Check out my video on static for a refresher if needed. So this function takes a file name and a block size as arguments and then returns the ID of the shared memory block it loaded or it returns IPC result error or negative one if it couldn't. And really this function is doing two things. It first uses FTOK to get the numeric key for the file name. Note that this second argument here is saying, I want key zero that goes with this file. So we could have more than one block associated with a file, for example, but we're going to stick with one and it's gonna be number zero for this example. Then if we're able to get a key for the file, then we call shmget to either load an existing shared memory block or create one if it doesn't exist. The first argument is the key we just got, size is the size of the block, and this last argument tells it first the permissions we wanna use. This is similar to how file access permissions are set. Then it also specifies that the block should be created if it doesn't exist. Again, this looks a lot like how we work with files, so it feels kind of familiar. Also, if this bitwise or operation here seems odd, you might wanna check out my video on bit fields. Then we just return whatever shm get returns, which is either going to be a valid block ID or a negative one. Now let's jump down to our first public function, this attach memory block. Now this function is going to call the function I just showed you. If it couldn't get a block, we're going to return null, just saying, hey, I couldn't get that block you asked for. If we did get a block ID, then I'm going to call schmat to map the block into my address space. This first for argument is of course the block ID. The second says, I don't really care where in memory you put this block. Most of the time that's fine. And third, we can specify some flags, some different options. For now, I'm okay with the defaults. So I'm just gonna leave it at zero. Then we return whatever comes back from schmat. It will be a valid pointer to the block in memory if it is successful. And then we can just return null if it's not. So that's how we load the shared block into memory. Okay, our next function, detach memory block, might not be necessary. It's basically just a wrapper around shmd, but this name might be a little easier to understand. It's definitely easier to pronounce. Feel free to omit this and just call shmdt directly if you like. Basically, this doesn't alter the shared memory block at all. It just says, I'm done with this, take it away. So finally, we have our function that is going to destroy a memory block. This is once again going to call our get shared block function because we need the block ID to pass to shmctl, which is going to do the actual destroying. IPC rmid means, hey, remove this thing based on this ID. The third argument is used for other operations, less destructive operations. Null in this case just means, I don't really care to get any information about the thing I'm destroying, just destroy it. And then we return whatever result code shmctl returns. So those are our core building blocks. Now let's put them into action. So our first program is simply going to take an argument from the command line and try with all of its might to write that argument into the shared memory block. It checks to make sure whether we called the program correctly, that's all pretty standard. Then it tries to attach the memory block or create it if it doesn't exist. If we get null back, then we complain loudly that something went wrong. Then we print out some status and use string copy to copy that first argument into the shared block of memory. Now that's all it takes to put new data into the shared block. Like I said, it's just memory. It's mapped into our address space so we can treat it like any other memory, any other array. It's just a pointer to a block of memory. Then that's all we're going to do with it. So then I'm going to detach the block and return. The second program is very similar, except it doesn't accept any arguments because it's just reading. 
it just attaches the block again, just like the previous one did, and then it prints out the contents of the block to the terminal, and then it detaches the block. The last program, our destroy program, is the shortest of them all, no arguments again, and it simply calls destroy memory block, and then tells us whether or not it succeeded or failed. And so that's really all there is to it. I have a make file here to build everything. It simply compiles all of the .c files to .o files and then links them all up into the appropriate three compiled binaries. It also has a fairly standard clean target down here at the bottom that deletes the compiled binaries. Again, check out my make videos if this seems at all mysterious. Now let's try it out. We open the terminal and we compile everything. Now let's start out by running our reading program. No funny business here, we print out nothing since there's really nothing in the block to print out. It's empty. Now let's put some text into the block by calling our write sh mem program. Any random text will do. Note that I need to use quotes if my text has spaces in it since my code only grabs the first argument of the program. Okay, good. Now if we run our read shared memory program, again, you can see that the shared memory block now has the new text that the other program wrote into it. And I can write new text into the block. Okay, now if we read it again, you can see that once again, it has been updated. And then we can destroy the block by running our destroy shmem program. And now when we go back to reading it, it's once again empty, just like we started. So this is working. We have a block of memory and multiple programs are accessing it and modifying it. Now at this point, you may be wondering with all this effort, why not just use a file? Everything looks so much like a file. We set things up with permissions and flags a lot like we do files and we need a file to find the block of memory in the first place. And the reason we don't use a file is that going to disk is slow. Writing it to disk, if we don't need this memory to persist forever on the disk, then going to disk is going to be slow. It's also gonna be a little bit awkward because we're gonna to have to have like write operations in, read operations out. And those read and write operations may be a little more cumbersome than just setting bytes in an array of memory. So in many cases, shared memory is going to be much faster and much easier than using files. And one word of caution though, using shared memory to share state between two processes can be dangerous. If you've seen my video on thread safety, well, basically we're looking at the same kinds of issues here. So you're gonna need some kind of synchronization, probably something like a semaphore. I've now mentioned semaphores twice in this video, so definitely a topic we need to cover in a future video. But in the meantime, now you know how to set up shared memory in your programs. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications if you wanna make sure you don't miss these future videos, including the semaphore video, which apparently is gonna come out at some point. Check out these videos for more tips and tricks and information about how you can become a better programmer by getting under the hood. And until next time, happy coding and I'll see you later.